goes in a topic that I'm going to love to talk about. <laughs> that is loving many things. One of the reasons this topic came up is that I have found myself, especially in the last, uh, I don't know, six months, has it been a year? I don't know. Loving so many things <laughs> and wanting to be so many places that I've wondered what in the world's going on with me. I, um, I thought maybe I needed a therapist. Or maybe it was one of Roger's Bud Lights that I needed, I'm not sure. <laughs> no, uh, it, it hasn't made me scattered, and I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes, too. There's a difference in loving many things and wanting to do many things, but then being so scattered that you can't focus to do what is most critical to do, right? And there maybe is the gift, <laughs> is that we can, uh, we all know a lot of people that uh, have, can be so scattered they can't ever get anything done, or they can have so many things they want to do that they don't ever get to the point or the goal that they actually wanted. So I guess as I would have all these thoughts about, of course, my family is blessed, okay, because I've traveled with my family. We've made it happen. Uh, we've been to Ireland and Scotland and Wales and England and Paris and Spain and Italy and Portugal and a lot of places. I may have left something out. But in my mind, all summer, I've been thinking of all those beautiful places we've been, the cathedrals, the mountains, San Francisco, the experience of being there, the experience of being uh, in Manhattan with Shelby, maybe, <laughs> Broadway. Bro all of it, I love it all. I love sitting by the lake, I love sitting by the ocean, I love uh, being on a boat, I love, I love it all, I love the mountains. Our younger daughter, Jonna, lives in Portland, Oregon, or now she lives in Hood River, one of the most beautiful places in the world. I love being there, too. And I just absolutely love it all and uh, want to experience it all. But the thing is, we have to be someplace, don't we? I can think about all those things and I can appreciate the fact that I've been there or maybe I'm going, but I also love being home. I love being right here. I love this sanctuary. I love every person present. I love the um, chairs, the, the candle <laughs> that Joey lit for us. <laughs> the prayers, the every single thing. I love walking down uh, the main street where we live in Long Beach. As a matter of fact, I have an example of that. One Saturday morning, um, I had just walked up to the Hancock Bank. It was a Saturday and I just dropped something in their night depository. And I'm just walking and happy and singing and smiling and you know, the wind's blowing and just as happy as I could be. And here comes Matt Wells <laughs> in his red truck, his sporty truck, I might add. It's uh, sporty, and he has the windows down, and he's singing and waving. And uh, I thought to myself, if we're not walking the unity talk, I don't know who is this morning. But I was just loving life, just right there, right where I was, loving every single thing, walking to the farmer's market and knowing that I was going to purchase something or some things there, maybe, to keep some locals going. But I do love many things. Has my, all, my life always been perfect? No, not actually. 
While they were playing, I was thinking especially about the 60s and the 70s and how painful they were for so many of us, having to live through the, uh, the Vietnam War, for one, and uh, being a newly married woman. I think I was 18. I was a whole of 18. And uh, Sherry's dad was... Uh, he was a student at Virginia Tech, and we lived in Arlington, and he was drafted and sent to war. And I was pregnant, and I had the baby by myself while he was in Vietnam. He was a minesweep. Can you imagine that? You imagine that? a government that would take, and I'm not dissing our government right now, what I'm dissing is the consciousness that created that, okay? I'm not dissing anybody. But a young man is going to be an engineer, and he's drafted. He was drafted into the Marine Corps. Basic training was hard enough, and then the training that they had to go to Vietnam to walk out and sweep for mines. What were they doing? They were volunteering their young people to find possible bombs, using their bodies to do it as they're walking back and forth, sweeping for mines. Well, it ruined his life. You can imagine that. He didn't die there, but you know, the way the last few years of his life ended, it may have been a blessing if he had. And this is his daughter sitting right there, Sherry, the one that plays the violin every Sunday. So beautifully and with so much love. And this young lady never got to know her father. Those are decisions that governments make, you know? Those in power, those that uh, don't really know what they're doing to their young people. I remember saying then, I'll go to Canada if you want to. I volunteered. But he couldn't do that because he'd been raised to, to do whatever his country wanted him to do. And his family probably would have been ashamed of him. So no, it hasn't been easy. I had a baby. I was 19. I was at Fort Belvoir by myself. You know, people have done tougher things. Maybe the next couple of years were the toughest, though, after he came home and couldn't ever acclimate himself to the world again. He died a broken man, a broken young man. We've been fortunate enough that uh, then we went on to, uh, I, you know, supported her a few years and went to university myself and did my best to improve our situation. She had some good grandparents, his parents, my parents. And then a few years later, I met Dan and there, that's the rest of the story. And he's been a good husband and provider and partner and father, the best that he could be to another man's child. And I'm appreciative of that. And I'm appreciative of her. And sometimes you may think that I'm, I'm overprotective <laughs> and I've stayed too close to her. I can't help it. That's the baby that was my world at a time where I didn't have a world. It all revolved around her and not knowing what the next day would bring, a telegram. It was not an easy time, but many people have lived through much worse.
But here's the funny thing. I was always joyful. I got a job, interestingly enough, because um, I was uh, a young mother and uh, I can't remember why, but Quantico Marine Base was there close by and I got a job there. And I remember one of my coworkers uh, said to me one day, he said, well, Judy, you've had a hard life, haven't you, honey? <laughs> For someone as young as you, and I was astounded. I said, who, me? No. I said, everybody loves me. I'm blessed. No, I haven't had a hard time at all. Everybody loves me. I hope all of you know that too. Somehow I knew that, even as a teenager and a young adult. I knew that. I knew that there was a love out there just waiting for each and every one of us. This morning, I had a, I told Miss Nay, she was up all night taking care of a neighbor. <clears throat> and with all these children she brought in this morning, they were half the congregation, weren't they? I told her if she was tired, she could just stay in here with us but that they would get a message they could understand, and I know they would, but uh, I spoke with them. I told her we're going to start having five minutes with the pastor every Sunday morning before church starts, and that way I can speak to each of the children, which I don't really get a chance to do. And so... Um, I told each and every one of them that what I was talking about this morning was loving many things. What does love mean? Well, we, we all know there's several different definitions of love. There's eros, of course, which we think of as romance, and um, platonic comes from Plato. And then there's agape. And agape is an overwhelming love of everything and everybody. And that's what I'm talking about when, this morning when I say I love many things and many things love me. I've always felt loved. I felt that love of God even during the times when I felt there wasn't a human hand there to hold my hand. I knew God was. And it wasn't the God that I'd learned about in my Baptist classes when I was a child. It wasn't that God at all, because that God we learned was to be feared. It, this was a different God. This was love. I knew there was a love surrounding me at all times. Sometimes there are things out there, atrocities we don't understand, and we never will. All we can say is there are certain humans in this lifetime, they don't ever get it. And they live from their ego and the fear and the meanness that comes from that, fear that they won't ever have enough, they won't ever have enough power. So they seek their power on the outside, the Hitlers of the world. They didn't ever know that there was a divine just waiting for them, and it was within if they would just go within and find it. They didn't ever know that. They didn't trust it. And I heard a sweet little story about a little girl that was in a bomb shelter late recently in U Ukraine with a whole group of people, and all of a sudden she just burst out in song from a song that uh, from the Disney movie uh it's let it go little songs everybody know yeah i can't i can't remember the movie it came from frozen frozen that's what it was and she with her sweet little angelic voice just started singing to everybody in that bomb shelter until they started to smile and lighten up love comes in many sizes doesn't it Many varieties. 
one inspiring word to a person online, maybe on social media. It means so much. I heard someone say the other day that until we all take the flags off our cars and trucks and the bumper stickers, take them off, that we're not ever going to have peace. If you need to fly a flag, it says you're into ego and power. If you need to put a bumper sticker on your car that says who you're going to vote for, you're, you're not into your internal loving self. You're into the outside. I believe that. I believe that until we can quit with the divisiveness in the war, there used to be a, such a thing as a conscientious objector. Does anybody remember what that means? And it means that there were people that, according to their faith, they could conscientiously object to going into the military. And I'm sure that term still exists. Well, I tell you what, I've known a lot of people in my life that are pretty conscientiously objecting all the time. <laughs> they couldn't find something positive to think about or throw out there if they had to. You know anybody like that? So on Facebook, before you paste, post something ugly, and y'all out there in the Etherland, listen to me here too. You wait 10 minutes. Come back to it. Say a prayer in the meantime, then see if you still want to do that. And I don't care what your persuasion is. Until we end this divisiveness, we're not going to have peace. But what I was going to talk about was loving many things. And there was this little boy who came home, told his dad, he said, I'm in love. His dad well said, said, well, how do you know you're in love? Well, I kissed this little girl down the street, and her dog bit me, but I didn't even know it till I got home. <laughs> So, I don't know, most of us don't have to pass that dog bite test, do we? Thank goodness. My husband, Dan, is up in Indiana. He's from uh, around Muncie, Indiana, and uh, they have an antique, um, what is the name of that crazy show at that um, uh, that place where so many men spend so much of their time and energy and their passion, <laughs> antique engine equipment show. And so he's up there, and they drag all kinds of rust over there to a ooh, <laughs> ooh, and ah over. I mean, it's just amazing. You just can't believe it. So he called me this morning, and he and his nephew were headed over this morning now 300 miles to pick up a piece of rusty something. <laughs> and when they get it back, they'll have to work on it all week. So um, I, I, I said, he said, I know you're going to throw me under the bus at church this morning about that. And I said, you know I am. <laughs> so so uh, in, anyway, I love to see that kind of passion about something. Anybody that's retired and they're depressed, find something you love to do and do it. I love to see passion. Vincent Van Gogh said this, it is good to love many things, for therein lies the true strength and whosoever loves much, performs much. 
don't they, Robbie? Yep, you do. You love it, what you do, don't you? Absolutely. I know you do. He deals with classy stuff, not that old rusty stuff. <laughs> it's still, so, for some of us females, it's hard to understand, but it, it's, it's all good. And whosoever loves much performs much and can accomplish much. And what is done in love is done well. So love it. Love it all. Love as many things as you can. Put your passion into those things you love and steer away from the others. Love, and if there's something you hate, do your best to stay away from it and quit hating it, okay? Do yourself a favor and do that. That's the closest way to be in love. I think it's A Course in Miracles that says we either love or hate. So I think I'll choose love. So this morning, this sanctuary... The train, we weren't blessed with a train this morning, were we? This week I had a, a nail in my tire and I, I was so blessed. I was, really, really. Listen, I knew my car told me that I had a low tire, okay? There's the first miracle. I knew I did, I knew I had a problem. My husband's out of town with that brand new, really expensive ratchet that I bought him that puts those nuts on real easily and takes them off. You guys know what I'm talking about? The, okay, so he was up there playing with all that rusty stuff with that brand new power tool that I had bought him for his birthday. So I thought, now there's got to be, they were going to be rehearsing here that morning. It was Friday morning, so I thought, well, heck, there's a good year. There's all sorts of tire places here on 49, and I know that God's going to be with me, and I'm going to make it, because I have 14 pounds in that tire, and I know I can make it. So I did, and I pulled into the good year and said, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you, God, for these guys that are going to fix my tire. And in the meantime, Sherry and Shelby had volunteered to come over and get me if I wanted to come to church. I said, no, I'm just going to sit here and give thanks. And I sat there the entire time and gave thanks for those guys that had that ratchet tool that's making that noise in there, that's taking that tire, the lift that put it up, took that tire off, fixed it. And when he came out, he said, ma'am, you had a nail about that long in your tire. I said, wow, I wonder where I got that. So when I told Dan, he, he said, hmm, he thought he was in trouble because we have reconstruction going on at home. And he's supposed to be, he was supposed to be uh, making sure the driveway was clean, you know. And I said, it's okay, Dan, it's fixed. There's no problem. Who knows where I got that nail? It didn't have to be in my own driveway, did it? <laughs> so he was off the hook just like that. But that's what love will do for you. It'll make you appreciative. You won't even notice the dog bite. It'll make you sing, let it go to a room full of people that'll feel, that are feeling desperate and alone. Sometimes it might even save your life or that of another. So I hope this morning I've convinced you to love many things the way I have chosen to do. And I thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for your time.